Okay, great. So, Kat, if you can press pound six, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Olivia Henzi from the New England Quinn QIO, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar is called Flu Season is Coming, Target Better Outcomes with Your Immunization Plan. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly review a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. I'll provide you with details on accessing the recording at the end of this webinar. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. If you could go ahead and, and put yourself on mute manually if you are able to, I do hear a little bit of background noise. So if you are not participating and could put yourself on mute manually, that would be fantastic. And we'll take questions at the end, and I'll provide you instructions on how to unmute your line. And at this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Kathy Roby. Kathy is the Connecticut Home Health Lead for the New England Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization. Kathy is a registered nurse with over 40 years of experience in home health care. She specializes in quality management, improving home health provider clinical outcomes, and reducing the acute care hospitalizations for Connecticut home care providers. Please welcome Kathy. Thank you, Olivia. I'm so happy to be speaking with everyone. It is just a glorious fall of May. I was on the phone on my way uh, to do this presentation speaking with someone who's actually leaving work to go to the beach. I am green with envy. However, the chill is in the air at night, and we know that the flu fall season is coming. Flu and pneumonia together can have a significant negative impact on your acute care hospitalization, on your emergent care, on your other outcomes such as shortness of breath. We want to be sure that we are maximizing every possible avenue to reduce hospitalizations and emergent care and to continue to achieve some improvement with our cardiovascular outcomes, such as improving shortness of breath. So as we go through this presentation today, I'm hoping that that's going to work. Um, Olivia, it's not advancing. Um, Kathy, if you'd want to just pass the ball back to me, I can advance the slides for you. I'm just trying to drop that little ball. I just click on your name for that? No, there should be a little ball next to your name, and you just click that and drag it and drop it next to my name. Or I can ask Emily to, to do that for us okay. if she's there. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. Um, as, you all, as you all remember, um, this presentation is being brought to you by the Queen QIO. That's our partnership with Health Centric Advisors so that we together can reach out to all of you in all six states. Slide, please. I wanted to show you on the um, website that we have all of the previous webinars, including today, are available on this location. This is where you will land. The circle tab is for the providers. And once you've clicked on that, the drop-down is going to give you a list. You're going to click on Home Health, and that will bring you to our events. It will show you upcoming events, and it will also give you the opportunity to find and rerun and use for training purposes any event that we've already presented. Slide, please. I also wanted to be sure that we had contact information, the most current, up-to-date information for each of the six states. If we are all here, all six of us, we are anxious to reach out to you. If there is anything we can do to help you, not just with immunization, but your ongoing performance improvement plans to reduce hospitalizations and improve cardiac disease-related outcomes, that's what we're here to do. And best of all, accessing us, reaching out to us, and having our expertise at your fingertips is absolutely free. Now, where in 2016 can you get a bargain like that? So let's move on and begin talking about banning the bugs, targeting a better outcome for the patients that we see, and using immunizations as a tool that can work for you and for the patients that you are seeing. As we begin to talk about this, slide please, 
we want to think about what our goal is for our hour together. First of all, in order for us to work with our patients, we need to understand why this is so important. So by the time we're done, you will have reasons to offer why it's important to give flu vaccine and the pneumovax to all the people you see who are eligible to receive that vaccine. How are we going to do that? At the end of this program, we hope that you will have picked up some tips on how to motivate all those identified eligible patients to agree to receive flu vaccine and or pneumovax if they've not already had that. We'll talk about identifying and making the connection between administering these immunizations and reducing hospitalization because it definitely has an impact. And one piece of that is making sure that as you answer the OASIS question on immunization, that you are answering them correctly. Many times, all six of us in all six states have spoken to providers last flu season and discovered that the reason their scores were not improving as quickly or as well as they had hoped was because they were actually answering the OASIS questions incorrectly. So we want to be sure that you understand the impact but also understand how to correctly answer the OASIS question to maximize the credit that you're getting. Lastly, as part of the Healthy People 2020, we want to be sure that we address the situation of staff immunization. Frequently, and more frequently as the flu season advances, you're going to see news articles, you're going to hear it on the great side. This or that nursing home, hospital, facility of some type, other home care providers, Ancillary support providers, homemaker companion living agencies. This one is mandating staff immunization. This one is not. Here it's an option. Here it's a requirement. The union has a say in it. The agency has a say in it. You need to think through what are the pros and cons and make a decision at the executive and senior management level what your agency wants to do in order to best protect not only your staff, but the patients that they are caring for as well. Slide, please. So I mentioned the Healthy People 2020. They have established target goals for these three items. The influenza immunization, they are hoping 90% of all eligible persons will receive a flu shot. In 2015, we were successful in immunizing only 66.65%. That's not quite fair, is it? Two-thirds of the way, but definitely not on target. Numidax fared even less well. The target, again, was 90%. And yet, in 2015, only 60% of the eligible persons were immunized. Giving immunizations to your eligible health care personnel. Again, the target was 90%. In 2015, we were successful in immunizing 45%, less than half of the eligible health care personnel. The hyperlink below the third immunization statistic is live. When you receive the slides, you will be able to click on this, and it will take you to the Healthy People 2020 website so that you can read more information about what the numbers are based on, why the targets were set at what they were, and additional resources and information to help you in achieving that goal. So the question I ask you now is, what was your goal? And what was your achievement level? What percentage of the eligible patients you saw in 2015 received a flu immunization? What percentage received Numovax? What did you do about your staff? And if you are in a value-based purchasing trial state like Massachusetts, 
you need to have this statistic because it must go through the portal. Think about what your agency data is telling you and how let that influence how you plan for the flu season that is beginning this very month. Slide, please. This brings us to our first question. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, what population has the highest hospitalization due to influenza? Pregnant women and small children, people with underlying conditions and chronic illnesses, children up to the age of five, or persons who are 85 and older. Olivia, can you refresh people on how to answer these questions? Of course, thank you. The poll is currently going on right now. Please press submit after you pick your choice, and uh, the poll will close momentarily. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Olivia. And we'll move on one more slide. The poll is done, so let's move on. Okay. The question should be available. Did you want to? Did you want to um, look at the questions now, Kathy, or would you like to do it oh, later? Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, what we have is that those on the line have said uh, 28 have ended 28 percent is saying that it's people with underlying chronic conditions. 16 percent are saying that it is 85 and older, and five have uh, 16 percent ages zero to five, and five said 85 and older. And the correct answer is actually individuals 85 and older. So that's interesting. Obviously, we need to think about what influences people contracting flu or pneumonia. And individuals who are 85 and older, many of them, if not a majority, also have an underlying condition or chronic illness. So that group is the reason why they are the most likely to get the flu or pneumonia because they are not only older, more fragile, uh, more likely to have uh, more compromised nutrition and hydration, but they are also far more likely to have underlying conditions and chronic illnesses. Let's move on. What's our next question? Who should we give pneumovex to? Absolutely everyone. People over the age of 65, people who smoke or have asthma, and people with an underlying disease process such as diabetes. Your polling question is there. Select one, and when the poll closes, we will then um, answer the question. Notice that this is one where you can select all that applies, not just only one right answer. Okay, we've closed the poll. Let's take a quick look at our scores. We just have to wait about 12 more seconds um, ah, just because not everyone pressed submit, but we <laughs> will be there momentarily. Very good. All right, well, while we're waiting for the results to come in, I will tell you that the correct answer is actually uh, B, C, and D. And it looks like the group has gotten that correct, with the highest number going to those with an underlying disease process such as diabetes. Um, although people who smoke um, and have asthma came in as a close second. So your answers are very good. You clearly understand about the pneumococcal vaccine. Let's move on. So I mentioned that there is a distinct link between the immunizations that we administer to eligible persons and improving our outcomes by reducing hospitalizations, reducing emergent care, and improving shortness of breath and other cardiac-related outcomes. When an individual, especially someone with an underlying disease process such as diabetes or asthma, these are people who are very prone to developing the complications it's harder for them to recover. It's much easier for them to uh, become malnourished, to become dehydrated. The shortness of breath 
can trigger additional cardiac complications. This is going to drive them to the emergency room. They may stay 36 or 48 hours for hydration to start antibiotics by infusion and then be returned home to your care, but that is still going to show as a negative outcome on your statistics. Individuals who continue to smoke or who have other ongoing respiratory conditions are at the highest risk for complications. They tend to develop long-term exacerbations of their COPD, of asthma, to have repeated crises because they are so compromised. What about your staff? Let's think about what happens when you have a home health aide or a nurse or a therapist who might actually see at minimum one or two patients every day, maximum upwards of five or six, if that individual is in the contagion stage, never immunized, they will have seen, they could see as many as 12 patients before they were sick enough to realize that they were exposing their patients to influenza or pneumonia. That is a risk. And that risk, that exposure, is going to drive up your cost because when they do go down from influenza, you now have to pay a per diem, another home health aide, another nurse, another therapist to cover their visit. That is going to increase your cost. And because those individuals may not know those patients as well, it could potentially have a negative impact on your ultimate outcome. Slide, please. We know that influenza and pneumonia have long-term effects. It decreases the individual's functional ability. Think about, particularly if you are a physical therapist, think about the significant change that happens when your patients did not get the flu, did not get the pneumovax, they contracted it from their visiting grandchild over Halloween or over Thanksgiving. They end up in the emergency room, in the hospital, 36, 48 hours, even something that short term. The individual who before they became ill was ambulatory in their home, comfortably able to walk, not short of breath, not having difficulty transferring, not having difficulty dressing and bathing. 48 hours later, they come home. Now, they're still somewhat dehydrated. They have new medications. They're short of breath. They're wobbly and unstable. They have become a much higher risk for falls, a much higher risk for other underlying infections to occur, and their cardiac and respiratory function is going to remain significantly impaired for an extended period of time. Someone who, had they been immunized, might have completed their episode of care with you in four or five weeks, now is suddenly going to be with you for the full eight and possibly need recursification. You can see the impact that this is having, not only on your outcomes, but on your costs. Even younger, healthier individuals can develop serious illnesses and complications that will have long-term impact simply because they may have an underlying condition they're not aware of. They might be younger and otherwise healthy except for asthma. And suddenly, influenza turns to pneumonia, turns to a long spell of being chronically short of breath, weak, at risk of falling. This is a you really don't need to have. Slide, please. Hi, Kathy. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties at the moment. Um, Emily, are you available to re-promote me um, to a – oh, perfect. Okay. It looks like um, – sorry about this, Kathy. Um, looks like I am um, – I'm in twice and I'm having some technical difficulties. Uh, em Emily, would you be able to re-promote me to a uh, – panelist or move the ball for me. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Very good. Okay. There we go. Thank you. No problem. So once you have made the decision 
that you're going to make sure that all of your eligible patients are getting the flu shot. How do you go about educating them? And how are you going to deal with those myths that are everywhere? What's the most common thing that we hear? To go out to visit a patient, to do a new admission, to revisit someone that you have on for services already. You mentioned the flu shot. And the immediate response is, oh, no, I never get the flu shot because I heard that the flu shot is going to give me the flu. Here at Qualadyne, we are talking about a building full of highly educated consultants. And yet, I heard someone say exactly that the other day. There's going to, there is, as a matter of fact, as we speak, a health and wellness clinic going on that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later. And they're offering flu shots. And that individual said, oh, no, I'm going to go and get my blood pressure checked and look at all the other things, but not get the flu shot because I heard it gives you the flu. We need to educate everyone, our patients, our community at large, and our staff, that the flu shot does not give you the flu. If you go to the American Lung Association website, you will find there is a handout that you can print off and use for free that lists the 10 most common myths about flu shots and pneumovax. Please, I encourage you, go to that website, print down that handout, and distribute it to all of your staff to take out and put up in their patient's homes so that you're educating not only them, but their extended family and anyone who comes in. Because it's important that we debunk these myths as quickly as possible. How do we go about screening our patients to immunize those who should be? How do we identify a quote-unquote eligible person? With all of these myths out and about, how do we motivate people so that they are not only agreeable but actively seeking to have flu shots every year and to get immunized with the Pneumovac? <laughs> and then how do we go about doing these immunizations as a home health provider and staying within the regulations? Slide, please. Yes, there we go. Now, here's another myth, and unfortunately, this one is getting a little help in the press. What do you say to the patient who says to you, I heard it on the news, that flu vaccine was no good. People are still getting sick. Well, they did actually hear that the flu myth did not prove to be as effective as was hoped it would be. So there is a distinct difference between flu myth and flu block. And yes, it is true that that is what they heard. Yes, it is true that their physician and you will be encouraging them to reconsider and to have a proper flu shot, not the nasal spray. So you want to be prepared to explain the difference between those two things. You want to also explain, and remember, at the patient's learning level, the potential that they could still get the flu if they contract a strain that is not included in this year's vaccine. The most recent literature that I found on the CDC website, the link that I gave you with Healthy Patients 2020 as well, both of those sites and the American Lung Association, in each one, they are indicating that the flu vaccine that is out this year is an excellent match for the strains of flu that is anticipated to be circulating that our patients and their families will be exposed to. So, again, at the patient's learning level, which we have been told that uh, the optimum learning level to teach at is approximately the fifth grade because when people are ill, a Ph.D. professor is still going to learn best at a fifth to sixth grade level when things are explained slowly and carefully with return explanation or teach back so you are positive that they have clearly gotten what you're trying to teach. 
Lastly, we're going to need to have handouts and very clear teaching on how standard precautions can help to protect them from that one or two small strains that might be out there that were not included in this year's vaccine. There are excellent free materials that you can obtain and distribute if you go to the WHO website, the World Health Organization, there's a search box in the upper right corner. If you enter in the search box this phrase, clean hands save lives. Once you click on that, it's going to take you to a site where you will be able to obtain standard precautions picture cards in English and in Spanish, and I believe they are available in at least two or three other languages as well. And you can then print these down for free and distribute them to the patients, to the households that you're serving. There are excellent videos in English and in Spanish that you can use to train your staff and to train your patients. Slide, please. So let's think about determining whether or not your patient is an eligible person. First and foremost, you need to obtain an immunization history. And we know that many of the patients and their families that we work with are not reliable reporters. If this person has been discharged to you from an institution of any kind, a hospital, a rehab facility, a SNF, a long-term care, you need to, if it's not on the discharge paperwork with a date and a specific immunization listed, you need to reach out to the referral source and attempt to confirm one way or the other whether or not this person has in fact had influenza immunization and or either of the pneumonia vaccines that are currently available. Then you need to determine, is this person a candidate to receive a flu shot or an pneumonia immunization? What are the criteria for that? Again, the criteria focus in on, is this individual over 65? And are they, if they're under 65, do they have a long-term chronic debilitating condition? Is the person interested and willing to receive a flu or pneumo vaccine immunization? And lastly, is the physician in agreement that he or she, the patient, should be immunized? Slide, please. We've mentioned that it's really important that we think about how we approach people. Many of our patients, especially a higher percentage of the older ones, they, many of them have really bought into those myths. The flu shot will give me the flu. I heard the vaccine was no good. I'm not letting somebody stick me with live bugs. Those top three and the other seven on that top ten list, use those as a way to open the door. On previous occasions, we've used, we've talked about motivational interviewing using the ORS process, asking an open-ended question. How will you protect yourself this winter? I heard your grandchildren are coming to show you their Halloween costume. What will you do? Children tend to pick up every virus going around when they start school again in the fall. How will you protect yourself from catching the flu, from your children, from visitors, from the people in the waiting room when you go out to see your doctor? What's your goal for this time period that I'm going to be staying and coming to visit you and take care of you? If you can elicit from the patient a goal of I really want to stay home out of the hospital and can continue to feel better every day, then you want to focus next on, okay, what's your plan? Let's see if together we can develop a plan so that we can make sure that you are able to feel better every day and to stay home, out of the emergency room, 
out of the hospital. The first step is to get the patient's buy-in and then revisit by focusing your education on the most common myths using that handout, which, by the way, I did check. I ran it through the Word program, and it is at a fifth to sixth grade level. So you should have no difficulty using that particular handout on the top ten myths about flu and pneumonia vaccines. And the standard precautions handout that's on the World Health Organization website, that is also literacy level and language appropriate. Slide, please. Many agencies are concerned about whether or not they should actually be offering immunization. This is a decision that only your agency can make for itself. Right now, there is no mandate for us that home health providers should offer immunization to our patients. We are not required to do so. We are strongly, in no uncertain terms, being urged to have a clear and structured immunization program because we know there's a direct correlation to decreasing acute care readmissions and emergent care episodes. We know there's a direct correlation to improving outcomes. So those are two very strong reasons for why you should at least offer the immunization to your patients. You're making a home visit anyway. If you bring the vaccine with you, you are not incurring any real additional overhead costs. And your agency is able to bill out for the cost of the vaccine and small administration charge through roster billing. Instructions on roster billing are available on the CNS website. What would you need? If you've never done it before, or if you have, but not on a really large scale, only on an occasional case-by-case -case basis, there are some very clear things that you need to have to manage this program effectively and safely. You want to have a package for your flu immunization program that includes having some policies around defining an eligible patient, using the um, CDC and World Health Organization definitions of an eligible person. You want a policy about how you go about doing the immunization. You want a policy about the orders. You're going to need a reaction protocol. If you have an active position on your professional advisory committee, which everyone should have, then you can get a standing anaphylaxis order from that physician, and then you will write out a reaction protocol so that you know if the nurse is administering the flu immunization in the home. For example, and this is obviously subject to the decision of your professional advisory committee and the physician on it. But an example would be that the clinician administering the flu in the home is going to stay with the patient for at least 20 minutes after the immunization is done. They're going to observe and assess for any evidence of reaction. They will have with them their anaphylaxis protocol as established by their agency, obviously, FE of some kind. So you would need a protocol and orders. You're going to need a patient-specific order for your own protection, especially if there's any possibility that that patient's physician is going to have something else in mind to treat a reaction. The easiest way to do it is to create an interim short order that simply says, has spaces to fill in the patient's name, the physician's name, the date you're sending it, administer flu shot, list out the information from the vaccine box with the type, the dose, the lot, and exactly what you're going to do. It has a standardized protocol for the reaction, potential reaction on it and gives the physician a space to cross that out and put in his or her own. So that any time you're going to do this, you could talk to the patient today, send the order out, get it back, and administer the flu shot. If you can accomplish that, then you will have 
all you're going to need is a billing procedure. The forms, the consent form and the questionnaire to determine if the person is eligible, no alert, allergy to eggs or feathers, etc. those forms are readily available on the CDC website and on the American Lung Association website. Slide, please. So if you decide to go ahead and have this kind of a program, or if you simply decide that you're going to make it your business to connect every patient with their physician, make an appointment, and make sure that they get immunized at their physician's office, you still need to collect your data. So let's talk a bit about your OASIS immunization questions. There are four. Influenza is addressed at rule 1041 and 1046, pneumonia at 1051 and 1056. The data is collected when you are completing a transfer discharge OASIS tour. There are certain common errors that occur, and so if people incorrectly interpret the questions they are answering at 41, 46, 51, and 56, this is going to give you a lower score and negatively impact your outcome ultimately. Slide, please. There we go. Let's take a look at 1046. This is where the most common errors occur. The question itself says, and like any other OASIS question, every single word in the question matters. Did the patient receive the influenza vaccine for this year's flu season? The CDC and CMS agree upon specific dates to define this year's flu season. Go to the CDC website. Put flu season date, onset of flu season, anything along those lines, in the search box, and you will bring up the dates for this year's flu season. So that's the first thing. Did any part of this episode of care start or resumption to transfer discharge? Did the patient receive the vaccine during this episode of care, assuming that the episode of care falls inside this year's flu season. Did they receive it in a prior episode of care? Did they receive it from another health care provider? For example, your agency does not choose to administer them at home, so therefore you arranged for them to receive that vaccine at a physician's office. You got them transportation. They went to the CVS or the Medimart, the Walmart pharmacy, and they got their flu shot there. No, the patient was offered, but they refused. The patient was assessed and was determined to have medical contraindications. If, in fact, they have a medical contraindication, an allergy, Guillain-Barre, a previous history of an acute severe reaction, these need to be confirmed with the physician because this is a situation where I would not be taking the patient's word or, oh, yeah, I had a bad reaction, my arm swelled up, et cetera, et cetera. You need to confirm that with the physician first. Perhaps the patient does not meet the age or condition guideline. Again, check off number six. There has not been a declared shortage at this time. There is plenty of vaccine to go around. It's also possible that the patient did not receive the vaccine due to a reason other than 4 to 7. So you want to look carefully at every single answer to this question. Make sure you answer it correctly and that you are looking at this year's flu season. The same applies to the Pneumovax question. Slide, please. If it's outside of this year's season, if it is medically contraindicated, 
if your patient is outside of the age and condition requirements. Your ultimate outcome score for this question is a numerical calculation. If any one of the first three items here applies, not this season, contraindicated, outside of requirements, this removes your patients from the denominator. When the calculation is done, this patient is not eligible. Therefore, this will not have a negative impact on the outcome. We, ex we need to go over this many times. You need to, again, reinforce this with your staff at your very next staff meeting. Put these questions, the pneumonia and flu vaccine questions, up on the wall. Make sure they understand that this is an instance where if any one of these three applies, it's perfectly okay. It is not going to have a negative impact on their outcome. Slide, please. Let's look at our polling question. Which of the following groups has the lowest rate of flu vaccination coverage? Nurse aides and nursing assistants, pharmacists, physicians, nurses. Select one of your answers on the polling screen, and as soon as the poll closes, we will provide you with what the answer was that you all submitted. Is the polling Thank question there? Yep. Thank you, Kathy. Um, the question is not up yet. Emily, would you be able to open up this polling question for us, please? I don't have the availability to open it. Perfect. There we Thank are. You. It's up. Excellent. There's the polling question. Again, remember, which of these groups has the lowest flu vaccination rate? Nurse aides, nursing assistants, pharmacists, physicians, or nurses? It's an interesting question, and it brings us, while I wait for the answers to come up, this is going to bring us to the topic of whether or not you should be offering flu immunization to your staff. The poll has ended, but we're going to think about that for a second. Are you going to offer flu to your staff? Let's move this slide forward and begin to think about that. Staff immunizations are definitely expensive, but sick time is more expensive than anything else. We have one-third of the group thought that nurse aides were the most likely to, were the least likely to receive a flu shot and that would be absolutely correct. But they're closely tied with, with nurses. Isn't that interesting? So our own staff are not very likely to be getting flu shots. Think about, however, the cost of your sick time. Yes, there's an expense. Buying a bottle of flu vaccine, I'm hearing even with who purchased it. It's running upwards of 125 or more for 10 doses. But is $12.50, even $15 per staff person, is that anywhere near the cost of having to replace eight hours of a nurse or worse, losing the patient visits that you should have made that day? Especially when you consider that an employee who's in the contagion phase is out there making visits and could be infecting the patient. Slide, please. Standard precautions may not be entirely enough. Influenza virus is one of the most highly contagious that we have found. Influenza gets passed on before the symptoms appear. One staff member out with the flu, affects all aspects of the agency. It's going to increase your cost. We know that. It's going to impact your outcomes, and it's not a good impact. It decreases patient satisfaction. How does it do that? Well, they got a substitute aide or a substitute nurse who didn't know where to find the meds they came to three four. who didn't know where to find the wound care supplies or drop something or contaminated something. The aide didn't know how to wash my back the right way. 
She didn't know where to find the soap. She used the wrong one. Decreasing patient satisfaction. And on top of that, how can you honestly look your patients in the eye and expect to convince them to become immunized if you do not offer it to your staff and set a positive example by saying to one and all, we believe in this, it's important, it's a necessity for your good health and your protection, and we're committed to seeing it through. Slide, please. So that brings me back to our final polling question. And I'm asking you to consider, will your agency offer immunizations to all staff? Will you offer it only to your direct service patient care staff? Or are you not offering immunizations to staff at all? So the question is available there. Note that we are not asking if you are going to mandate immunizations, only if you are going to offer them. So if you would select an answer that best reflects what you believe your agency's policy will be, to offer immunizations, to have perhaps a staff clinic, make it available to everyone, or make it available only to patient care service staff. It's a good question. The question of whether or not, as a provider, we should mandate the immunizations is not one that I'm going to address in any detail today. I will say, however, that I encourage you to think about that. Think about how you would approach it if you were going to. If your agency already does, think about how you're going to explain that to the staff, how you're going to encourage them to look at it positively. So right now, 12 out of the group on the phone, or 50%, are planning to offer it to all staff. And 50% are not and did not answer the question. So I'm hoping that we've at least given everybody something to think about in terms of your staff, the impact of not immunizing staff can have on patient care and your patient care outcome. And I hope that we've helped you a little bit to think about how you answer your OASIS questions and how you're going to persuade, motivate, and immunize all of the patients under your care. Slide, please. We all remember that the Million Hearts Initiative is an active part of our project, of our Home Health Agency Collaborative. So how is your agency going to support winter wellness? 50% of those of you on our call today are having agency-sponsored immunizations. On that World Health website, you can print off or order laminated posters to post up in all of the food and laboratory areas in your office. I personally recommend that they go on the back of the bathroom doors so that anybody going in or coming out is reminded to please wash their hands. Think about also ordering the other poster that strongly encourages people to stay home if they are not well. Those of us in healthcare, especially physicians and nurses, we tend to acquire that uh, winter wellness martyrdom syndrome. I'm not that sick. My patients need me. I have so much work to do. I just, I have to go to work. So we come into work with the flu, and we sit there and sniffle and sneeze at our desk because, after all, I must be ind indispensable. But we're not. And we are going to get better faster if we stay home when we're not well. On the World Health Organization website, there's a terrific poster that says, under the weather, stay home, and put, leaves a space for you to put the phone number that they should be calling if they're not going to be coming to work. So think about that. What a terrific topic for your next month's in service. Do standard precautions training, standard precautions competencies, Hang up the posters in your kitchen or break area on the back of the bathroom doors, and one poster at least somewhere, preferably in the food and laboratory areas, to remind people to stay home if they're not well, so that they are not spreading flu or other viruses throughout the agency and to their patients and their peers. 
slide, please. Before we move on to peer-to-peer -peer sharing, I mentioned earlier briefly that our company here at Qualadine is having a wellness fair today. This is part of our commitment to the Million Hearts Initiative. A large group of vendors, insurers, pharmacy companies have all come together to work with us, and they are putting on a health and wellness fair. They're going to offer flu shots there. There's going to be tips on how to stay healthy and well, on improving your blood pressure, improving your cholesterol, getting at least some form of exercise. It's a wonderful way to bring in the winter season and to help promote the Million Hearts of Wellness Initiative as an employee health performance improvement project. Just think about it. And if you are interested in hearing more about how we did that, reach out to me and I will put you in touch with the person who is spearheading that initiative here in our office. Marissa has done a terrific job of all of the employee health and wellness tips and setting up this program, and I know she'd be happy to help you do one in your company. So that brings us to peer-to-peer -to -peer sharing. Many of you are doing a tremendous job of collecting data, then putting it on the cardiovascular data register. We all share a common goal, and that's to improve the outcomes of our patients' episodes of care. When I first came into home health, and I realized I'm older than dirt, and that was a really long time ago, agencies reached out to one another. It wasn't just that we, oh, well, that person lives in that town and I don't go there, so let me just call and make that referral over there to that agency. It was also, we're doing this. Would you like to do it with us? Oh, you need a form? Here's a form that I'm using. We reached out to one another. We shared ideas. And by working together, our outcomes improved together. If you have a project, a program, an idea, something that you're doing and you would like to share it, if you're willing to share, if you're doing immunizations in the home setting in volume, you have a program that works well, it works smoothly, you have sample forms, a process, a policy, please call me. Call the home health lead for your state. Send us an email. Reach out to us. We will work with you. If you are uncomfortable with being the person speaking on a webinar for the six states, if you give us the material and you are on the line, we'll present it. But we really, really want to help you to reach out to your peers because I think it's the most important thing. It's the most sharing and caring thing that you can do to help your patients because we'll all benefit. Slide, please. Tomorrow. The third Thursday of the month, next on the third Thursday of the month, next week, you will see there's a webinar from HHQI that is related to improving cardiovascular outcomes. Make sure that the HHQI website is on your desktop, on your computer as a favorite. Make sure that you go there today and register for this month's webinar and take a look at all the previous webinars they've done. Perhaps you've lost your quality management person. Perhaps you just have never had a designated person. They have a tremendous multi-part webinar series on how to do a quality management project, on the PDSA process, how to start a project, collect the data, evaluate it, revise it, and keep on improving. They have tremendous resources. And so all six of us as the home health lead for this project strongly encourage you, go to HHQI, look at this material. If you need help, call us. We are always happy to work with you. Slide, please. And I think that brings us to the end. So I hope that we've answered some questions, given you a little guidance. I will be on the line for a few more minutes. If anyone has a question for me, I'd be happy to answer it. 
Um, if you're more comfortable just reaching out to your state lead by email, please do so. Um, we are very anxious to hear from you. If you need assistance with anything at all, data collection, selecting an outcome to work on, just reach out to us by email or by phone, and we'll be right there at the other end waiting for you. Thank you. Are there any, are there any questions in the chat box? There aren't currently in the chat box. If you would like to ask a question, you can post it in the chat box. Just make sure you send it to all participants. Um, or you can ask a question on the line. Please just press pound six to unmute your line, and you can ask a question. Okay, if we have no questions, I'm going to let it's everybody go. Oh, so we have actually, one? Kathy, it looks like we have one in chat. Someone, Cheryl has asked, what about high dose and quadro, quadrivalent? Quadrivalent. Quadrivalent. Yes, um, those are available. However, the high dose flu shot and the quadrivalent, I would strongly recommend that you have a direct conversation with that patient position of record before you make that recommendation to the patient or before you actually administer either of those two. There are specific criteria and circumstances. I don't have the printouts with me because I'm remote today, but because these are unique, I think that this needs to be a decision made by the patient's physician after a conversation with that patient in the context of that patient's own specific medical history. So I'm really appreciative that you asked that question because these are options that are out there this year. Patients are hearing about them. I know that there are several local flu clinics being run by senior centers and health departments in our area, and they are advertising that they are going to offer this. If you are seeing a patient that you are going to send to one of those clinics, I would ask that you suggest to them or that you make the call for them and find out what the physician's opinion is because there are criteria attached to these that need to be considered before the patient makes that decision. And I think the physician might be concerned if he or she was not contact, not included in that decision. Anything else? Thanks, Kathy. If anyone else has a question, they can press pound six to unmute their line, or they can ask a question in the chat box. Just make sure that you pose it to all attendees or all participants. I'm sorry. So, again, we're, we're getting to the end here, so I will uh, go ahead and um, – finish up my concluding messages. Um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to jump in. But I want to thank everybody for a great discussion, and I just have a few last-minute announcements before we end the call today. Uh, when you close out of this webinar, the evaluation will automatically pop up on your computer. If you could please fill this out, we would greatly appreciate it. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now, or you're currently sharing a computer with someone else, you'll receive it. Hello? You'll I'm receive here. an email. Hi. You'll receive an email tomorrow morning with the link to the evaluation as well as the link to the event page on our website. The PowerPoint presentation is posted on our website, and within the next few business days, a recording and a transcript will also be added. Be on the lookout for emails about our next webinar in October, and thank you again for attending. I hope you all have a great day, and I just want to thank you, Kathy, again for a wonderful presentation. Enjoy the sunshine, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a, Have a great day. Bye now. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.